Thank you, guys. Okay, um, yeah, I'm with Netflix. I'm a senior data engineer. I'm part of the bigger data engineering and analytics org at Netflix. Within that org, I work for a personalization team, and we work with the team that helps Netflix personalize its member experience. So I assume most of you, if not all of you, are Netflix members. And what do you think is Netflix's mission? I'd say we want to entertain you. We want to, find, we want to help you guys find stories and shows and movies that you love, and we want you to help you enjoy them. Except that we want to make this experience personalized for you. Your con there's so much content out there. There's so many shows, so many great movies at Netflix that we don't want you to waste your time trying to digging through this content and trying to find stuff to look for. We want to help you reach that decision faster and get to start enjoying. Now, this is a snapshot from my own homepage. If you will see, my own homepage looks very different from your homepage, and it's different for every single person. And my homepage doesn't look the same every day. So this homepage changes for every single member of the Netflix. It changes every single day. Now, you have to wonder if we are changing these home pages for all of our members every single day, how much data are we processing and computing to generate this kind of experience? Let's look at some numbers. Netflix has upwards of 93 million active members who come and enjoy the service every day. Collectively, all these members consume more than 125 million hours of viewing. We are now live in more than 190 countries, and why is this special? Because all of these countries have content that is unique to them. They have local content. There's some content that's available in certain countries and not. And that makes it a little more challenging for personalization. We don't want to recommend you stuff that you can't watch. Now, owing to all of this, with these millions of members consuming these many hours of viewing every day, it generates more than 450 billion events every day. What are these events? These events are users' interactions with our website that tell us, they tell us how you're enjoying our service, what part of the service you like, what made you make the decisions you made to choose the shows that you did. And to give you an idea, because we are processing all these user actions and events every day, we have more than 600 Kafka topics that are recording and logging all of this data every day. So we are kind of the house of data. Now, this is a video. Uh oh. Um, okay. This is a live snapshot of all our services. Netflix has a microservices architecture. What that means is that we have multiple dozens of these services, each that is required to do one simple task and do it really well. The top node that you see there is going to be one of our edge servers that's taking all the requests and user actions from each of the devices. It could be your iPad, your laptop, your TV. Every time you interact with Netflix, the device sends back data and tells us what you did. These edge services then route these events and data into services that are interested in these events. For example, when we talk later, I will tell you about a service that I'm interested in, and it happens to be somewhere in the middle of that shot. Now, because this doesn't tell you much, let's go, let's go a little deeper. What? Sorry, guys. OK. This is a little more detailed and hopefully more understandable view of that video. So each of these mi those microservices we saw were our application instances. These are the many live services that process all these events that are coming into our service every day. These microservices receive these events and then further enrich them from other hist historical data that they might have. For example, if I see a show and that event goes back, I might have seen that show before, and I want. And in the data engineering, we might want to know that kind of information. It flows into this massive ingestion pipeline that we have, that we call the Keystone pipeline. What this pipeline is? It's a collection. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so this pipeline is a collection of hundreds of Kafka topics and routing engines that take all of this data 
and then route it to the services that will process them. Once all of this data flows into the pipeline, the pipeline will intelligently distribute it into its destination Kafka topics, which people will subscribe to. Eventually, these Kafka topics serve as final destinations, which are then automated and annotated to automatically write this data into our raw storage, which in our case is S3 and HDFS. Now, this is where the data engineering team comes in. We, depending on what part of data engineering team you're in, you, run, you consume all of this raw data, which is sitting in S3 and HDFS, and you apply your batch jobs on it. We have a collection, we have a big ecosystem of batch jobs. We run Spark jobs, we run pig jobs, we run Hive queries. These queries process the data, aggregate them, they, persist, they go to Elasticsearch, sometimes they go to Druid, they go to final Hive table. By the way, if you want to dig deeper into our batch ecosystem, Another of my DEA team members is going to be talking tomorrow at 12.20, and he's going to do a deep dive into the batch ecosystem. But I'm going to talk about how we are considering replacing or complementing some of our batch jobs with streaming jobs, where it's going to make sense to do that. Now let's go back to how we personalize your experience for you and how that whole thing kind of ties back together. What happens when you watch a show on Netflix is that you're going to watch a show, and then we are going to record or capture your preference and taste that flows back into us. We are going to try and record what show you watched, where in the home page you decided to make that decision to watch that show, at what, how many things did you browse and not decide to watch. You know, it tells us all about what you ultimately made the choice to watch. All of that data flows through and is picked up with by the DEA teams. DEA is, by the way, our organization. We then use our SPA, Spark for our ETL, and then we feed this data into the Netflix research teams, who incidentally also use Spark. And they use Spark for model training, model evaluation, they run all their pipelines, and then they retrain their models on the newer data that we have provided them. Once the model is retrained, they generate newer recommendations for you, the next time you go on your service, your tastes are reflected. The choices you made in your last session have an effect of what you're recommended this time. So all of this is already running, and we're running bad jobs for it. Now the question is, why would we want to replace or complement our bad system with streaming jobs and do all of this extra effort? There are a couple of advantages. One, obviously, is to make the product better. How do we make the product better? Since we're consuming so much data, and there's such a large volume of data being collected from all over the world, this data is very rich in a way that it represents things that are popular on Netflix, people are watching, what shows are trending. And all of that information actually changes pretty fast. So why wait an entire 24 hours to process that data and pick up that signal when you can pick up that signal in the next five minutes or 10 minutes? So that is the biggest subpoint of this. It also enhances research in a way that tip all over the world, model training is done offline. No, people haven't really experimented with what it takes to train these models with real-time data sets. And we want to give the research teams that opportunity to explore a whole new class of algorithms that can be trained on these frequently updated data sets. There are also technical wins. So sometimes the events, the way they are logged, they're sent through these pipelines, they go through several of these microservices. Each service tags along their own data that they want with the data. By the time it reaches the end, your event or your raw data can be at this fat blob of raw data, out of which you may only want a really small section of it. Maybe you're consuming a big JSON that has 100 fields in it, and you only care for 10 of them. Now, even for those 10 of them, this entire fat JSON is sitting in your raw storage for an entire 24 hours without anybody to consume it, and even if nobody cares for those 90 fields. But with streaming, you process what you need, you throw away what you don't, and you move along. Another big win of, uh, of going streaming is the long-running jobs. Before, I, mean, I mentioned all the stats and how many events we are generating every day and all of that user activity. There can be a certain small subsection of bad jobs that have to process maybe an entirety of a really big data set. 
And these bad jobs, despite the fastest computing engine and everything you might try, can be really long running. One of my bad jobs takes seven hours to run. Now what happens when this job that runs for seven hours fails in the middle? Not only have I lost the three and a half, four hours of the job that was running and it failed, after I fixed the issue, maybe it was a source data issue, maybe the data was corrupted, maybe I had to do a hot code fix. I have to then restart that job, and now that job takes another seven hours to run. So I have spent 10 to 15 hours in data correction or code fix. In streaming, if you had to do some correction, if you wanted to change course, you wanted to change something about your pipeline, you can do it on the fly. You bring your app down, you correct what you needed to be corrected, and then you put it back up. The data can be recovered, you reprocess the data that you wanted to reprocess, and again, you produce fresher and better results. So let's talk about the specific problem that I was trying to solve with Spark Streaming. This is like a typical Netflix homepage. As you can see, we have a lot of rows, what we call are these individual sections from which you make a choice to watch a show. It can be trending now, it can be your own continue watching, it can be your top picks, it can be a lot of things. You go to your Netflix homepage every day, you look at all these options that you have, and you make a choice. That choice becomes your source of play, which means what part of this experience made you choose a video and go f and make a play out of it. That information is very useful. We want to know which rows got it right, which rows got it wrong. Maybe trending now is a great row, and people are choosing a lot of videos from that row. Maybe there are certain rows that we are not doing such a good job of recommending videos in, and people are never choosing to watch videos from that row, which means we need to do a better job at training those rows. That's the source of discovery, source of play pipeline, as I like to call it. As you will see, continue watching is a very poor source of discovery. You never really discover anything from continue watching. You're just going to watch what you saw yesterday or a week ago. However, in this scenario, Trending Now is a great source of discovery. Trending Now runs on our Spark streaming app. Trending Now tells you what are the most popular movies and shows that are being watched by people around you. And people do actually end up watching a lot of shows from Trending Now. You know, maybe they've discussed it with their friends, they want to stay on top, all of that. And we could see there are all these rows that are represented, so we want to find out what's happening when, where you discover the show from. Now, my source of discovery pipeline has this kind of ecosystem. We mentioned the microservices. All these microservices are built on top of the Netflix open source stack. And like I was saying, they receive events from the user devices, they enrich these events with their own historical knowledge, and they write it to Kafka. The, my Spark streaming app runs on Mesos and uses Marathon to keep it a long-running job. The Spark Streaming app also, because it wants to gather more information about where the play came from, where the show was shown on the website, talks to a live service, which is our discovery service. I also want to know more about the show, what kind of show it was, what kind of, an exp what kind of contract window it had, and all of that. So I will talk to my Hive Metastore. And once I have produced this data where I have enriched the viewing information about the play from the kind of, from the discovery, from where the location in the service discovery was made, I can process this data, I can write it back to Kafka for other people to consume it. I also back it up in S3 so that model training can happen off of it. Now Spark Streaming. Um, Let's assume we know a little bit of Spark Streaming, some of us don't. So I'll give a quick overview of what Spark Streaming is all about. Spark Streaming, much like the bad jobs in Spark, needs a context. The only difference is we have a streaming context here as, as opposed to a Spark context, which happens in bad jobs. What we also have is a batch duration, which tells the engine how long to hold the stream that it's listening to for so it can be processed. So Spark Streaming operates in a micro-batch paradigm where it's not really processing an event as it comes through every single event at a time. It's going to aggregate all these events for some time, and that time is your batch duration, and then going to send it to your scheduler to process these batches. Data is received in what we call D streams or discretized streams, 
which have a really simple API to convert them RDDs. This is particularly helpful if you've already been playing with Spark Batch, you have your functions and you have all your code written to process RDDs and you have your batch jobs running. You can reuse almost the entire code as is, just convert the D streams into your RDDs and perform all your transformations in it. So since once you've converted into RDDs, all your transformations, operations are now available in addition to some windowing operations that are available. Maybe you don't want to process that event just the very second it arrived. You want to process it in context of other events that might be arriving in some time. Maybe you want to wait for another hour, another thing will come along, or you want to dedupe your events and remove duplicates. You want to aggregate them over half an hour or one hour. That's when time-based windowing can come in. You can hold the events for some time, process them, and then move forward. There is this concept of checkpointing, which addresses what I mentioned a little before, is that when you have long-running jobs and they fail, you have to restart them. Even in streaming, to take care that your job can restart gracefully, you have to do checkpointing, which is you talk to a persi persistent data store and you tell it what was the last state of your app that was running, so that in case of failure, you recover from the point you left off. Deployment can be done fairly similar to how you deploy your batch jobs. You can use Spark Submit to deploy your job, except you will now need, a, need an engine support that can run a long running job. This is not a bad job that you can submit and then it finishes and it has to be running 24 hours. And that's what I mentioned earlier is that we use Marathon, which allows for long running apps to be done. Now, once you have your Spark app and you've written the code and you've followed these fundamentals, you've put the basic elements in place and you've deployed it on Marathon or your choice of scheduler, you will find it's, it's possible, you know, you'll hit jackpot on the first go, but that's not what happens most of the time. You will now need to scale it depending on your volume and your traffic. So this is a snapshot from my first few attempts when I deployed the job. This, by the way, is a really bad state. So if you can see, my batch interval choice was 30 seconds, whereas the processing time is four minutes. What does that mean? That means that I thought I will process every single batch that I receive in 30 seconds, but actually my app took four minutes to process that job. That could be from a variety of reasons, which I'll cover in the next slide. But what essentially that means is that for three, it took three minutes and 30 seconds more than it should have for every single batch. And if it's 30 seconds, you add that, and in that it's processing hundreds of batches, that kind of adds up for every single batch. Now if it adds up for every single batch, if my first batch hasn't finished, the scheduler cannot give the next set of batch, which has already come, which in three minutes, 30 seconds, are now seven batches are waiting for the first batch to still finish. Over time, what will happen is that these batches collect and they accumulate in memory, and A, I could run out of memory, Two, if this time goes on in, for a really long time, my Kafka topics TTL will expire and I will lose data. So what is what something we can do to make our app more stable, tune it? These are some knobs and parameters we can play with. Like I said, the choice of micro batch interval, very important. It's a function of how big your data size is, what your data volume is, how is your traffic, how much time will your engine actually take to process that batch interval. You need to know how much time your engine spends in ev processing every single event that it gets. How many network calls are you making? It is, is it computationally expensive? If you're going to talk to a meta store, how long is that call? So you need to do that, some of that math. Now, you could say, hey, if batch interval is so critical, I'm just going to make my batch interval five minutes and give my events a lot of time to process all of that data so we can make all the calls we want. But depending on your traffic, for example, in this app's case, the peak traffic was more than 10,000 events per second. You hold all of that data for five minutes in memory, and you start to run out of memory on your instances. One thing that you can also do is make sure that you're achieving the maximum possible parallelism on your cluster. Now, these streams will naturally partition your request to the number of partitions in your Kafka topic. So if your Kafka topic comes with 100 partitions, it's going to create 100 receivers for them for it to listen to those partitions and then process the events. 
maybe you have a really good cluster and you have more than you have more computing power than the 100 receivers so you can do a repartition now repartition is a little expensive because it moves your data around it creates a, it has a shuffle but from that moment onwards you have achieved a higher level of parallelism number of cpus and you know the number of cores you request is essentially saying take a stock check of your cluster size see how many cores you will need to process the batch in the batch duration that you have provided. So you play off with all of that, you turn one knob up, one knob down, and this is a state of a good stable app. As you can see, the scheduling delay is almost close to zero, it's of six milliseconds. The processing time is 22 seconds, which is comfortably below my batch duration. You should always give some buffer from your batch duration to your processing time to allow for peak traffic. And the total delay is also 22 seconds, which in good cases, it should match the processing time, which means the second batch is waiting 22 seconds for the first batch. Now, if the batch duration is 30 seconds, that's good, because it's always waiting less than the amount of time that is allowed for that batch. So that's performance tuning. There are some challenges. Spark, like I mentioned before, has a micro batch paradigm. Um, it's not a pure event streaming system. Um, in cases where time is very, very sensitive, you have millisecond SLAs, Spark may not be the best choice. Unlike some pu really pure event streaming systems like Storm, Flink, where you process an event as it goes, and you can try and maintain an SLA of sub-seconds, Spark is not a place where you can easily achieve that kind of SLA. Um, tuning, scaling up, like I said, it, it takes a few attempts. It's not a huge challenge because personally, I think all scaling attempts take time and you will need to have that investment in a lot of apps. The little challenge that is different in Spark is that batch interval is very critical. Unlike scaling that comes with a lot of other engines, there are a lot of things you can solve with hardware or better quality of your instances or, you know, in, but here this is, your batch interval is the parameter you choose for your app. And if you have chosen this wrong, you could have the biggest cluster, you could have really high power instances and your app won't be stable. My last point um, may not be valid for those of you who are experimenting with 2.1.0, which now has custom windowing but I was playing with 1.6.1, which only had time-based windowing, which makes it really hard for session stitching use cases, which need to you know, have more, uh, something other than time-based windowing. Maybe you want to wait for a certain kind of event to come along before you process another event, and that, or you want to process out-of-order events, and that, was, that is not possible in older batches of, older versions of Spark streaming. There are also some challenges that are broadly applied to just going from batch to streaming. What, in, especially in worlds of data engineering and analytics where we are so used to batch, the resiliency of it, the maturity of it, um, that there is a lot of pioneer tax to be paid when you make such a big shift from batch to streaming. Even for the business side of it, when we have these frequently data, frequently updating data sets, it, it takes a lot of testing to fully really realize if the model, the output that's coming out of this online training of the model is truly better quality than the offline training. And like I said, it may only apply to a small subset of things. The criticality of outages. Now, I said before that if you, this streaming is so much better than long running jobs, but it comes at a cost. It comes at the cost that if your streaming, if your bad job is down, and you know it's going to, you can fix it, you can run it again. There is no really you know, fear of data loss because the data is sitting in your raw storage, it's going to be there, you can take your time, you can fix your code, you can fix it the next day. You're not going to lose data when you read run your bad job. In streaming jobs, especially in paradigms where we are all reading off of Kafka topics or live stream where the, da the data can expire in a finite amount of time, your app is down for too long and you run into data loss. There's also infrastructure investment, and this is largely following from the, set, from the point above, is because, because keeping your app up and running at all times is so important and so critical, 
you want to kind of prepare yourself up front. So you have to put all the checks and balances to make sure that you find out if your app is unhealthy before it goes down. So you want to have monitoring, you want to have alerts, you want to have your debugging tools in place. Your bad jobs, I think, Sometimes you can, you know, you don't need to have super updated monitoring alerts. It fails, you can go dig in the logs, see what went wrong. You have that buffer time to play with. That's not something you have with streaming. So that's an overall tax that comes with it. Questions, guys? Yes. With the new release of Spark coming out, or the, the recent releases, mm -hmm. uh, what changes to your architecture would make it easier to create and easier to kind of reason. I think one of the uh, features, sorry? Could you just repeat the question? Okay, the question was what, are, uh, what does the new release of Spark streaming, especially with the newer version, brings us that we don't have today? Um, the feature that I mentioned I'm most excited about is that it will have event-based windowing, which means you will be able to process out-of-order events. In terms of deployments and infrastructure, I, I could be missing something because I haven't played with 2.1, but I, I haven't heard of or I don't see any big changes. You talked about uh, modeling on real-time live data. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit, a little bit more about it, how exactly you achieve that, what technologies you use? So this would flow into our ML pipelines that are using, so we generate features for our algorithm teams. And depending on the nature of your feature, this could be really valuable. For example, one of our features is how popular a show is in a country at a given time. Now that kind of feature is time sensitive. Something that is popular right now may, not, may change in popularity in the next hour. Right now all these models pick up this feature once a day. But the same model, if it picked up this feature multiple times during the day as the feature is changing, it can send a signal to whatever you could have. Maybe you have a trees training model kind of signal, and that's picking up the signal to do um, feature generation. So that's where it kind of plugs in, and you pick up a signal sooner, and the model picks it up and can train and do better recommendations. Uh, what um, data formats and containers have you like worked with and, and what works best for streaming in your opinion? In terms of da data formats, um, it will really, it kind of follows the same paradigm as Bash. There isn't anything specific you need to think about in streaming. Um, we've worked with, I've worked with JSON. A lot of my hive tables are in Parquet because in Parquet you can push the predicates down. So. Essentially, anything that you would solve for reducing your I.O. tax in batch, you can do the same thing in streaming. How are you handling the unique counts across micro batches? That's a good point. Like I said, um, so Spark streaming guarantees, um, it guarantees at least once. But you can use time-based windowing to do deduping. Sometimes that can be critical and then you need to be really sure you, you need to have larger time windows to do these YouTubing over. Um, in my case, it was okay to have duplicates because there were downward jobs that were resilient towards duplicates. But the unique count, I mean, it really varies from time to time. You can use, um, you can also like persist these things to a persistent data store. You can have a transactional store talk to it, update the state every time. You can update states using like update state by, state by key and all of that in, in, your, in your streaming context and that's how you can maintain state. Uh, <clears throat> given the extreme uh, variance between uh, on-peak and off-peak usage. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if, if either at Netflix or if you know of anything going on in Spark, which will come up with a more adaptive model for representing the, uh, the batch intervals, so you don't have to have a fixed interval. That's a very good point, and that has been one of the challenges with choosing a batch interval that remains static for the entire lifetime of your app. And which is why I said the choice of batch interval is so, it, it's tricky, you know, because in an event, in a pure event-based um, streaming engine, something like Flink or Storm, you could use elastic, um, 
Neymar to scale up the services that you're going to talk to and you can handle peak and off peak. But in, in this kind of a scenario, you are, at least I have designed for peak traffic. And in that case, in off peak traffic, there is going to be under utilization of the cluster. But since right now there is no way for you to change your batch interval without redeploying the app, you just have to live, you just choose like the best batch interval for your peak traffic and then you live with it. That is, that is a big challenge. A little bit more on the science side, you mentioned the best discovery is happening in the trending now section. So I was wondering if the trending now is also tailored to users specifically or if that was more generalized and if you have any, any other comments on discovery in general. We're running out of time, but I'll do a quick answer. Trending now um, is a collection of both. There is, there is data flowing in that's capturing what is the like, non-personalized view of the world. It's just generally saying what is popular, but we do personalize it in a way that we consider the context you're in. It could be your geographical context or it could be some other preferences. And by the way, that thing I said that trending now is working, these graphs also change. Because we are training our models every single day, and every single day a model is generating a new pre-computed page, every day these numbers and these rows shift on how well they are performing. That was a snapshot from one of the days. So one day somebody could have put a model for another row, and it could have done really well. OK, thank you very much. Apologies, we're kind of pressed for time, but obviously some great technical questions there. And um, Shelley, you'll be around as well? Yeah, so yeah I'm around. OK, okay. please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.